I want to extend an especially warm welcome. To we have uh, uh, 20 young people here on the Pathways to the Professions scheme attending the lecture tonight. So warm welcome to you especially. Uh, but the audience is a very mixed audience. In the audience there are uh, experts, colleagues from the university, people who have worked with our, our lecturer tonight, and many other members of the public and of the university community from very different backgrounds, with very different interests, who've come here tonight. And who, many of you, and see, have been to many or all of these lectures. I've been to all of them, and I have to say they've been remarkably stimulating. It's been really an exciting experience. Uh, last week's lecture really talked about the problems of population and really drew our attention very clearly to the importance of global health for long-term control of population. The point that he made very eloquently and very clearly was that when communities are poor and when children die young, then those communities have large families to ensure that children will grow up to look after their parents in their sickness and old age. And that actually addressing these problems of poverty and the disease burden are really key to our long-term control of population. So it's not only a moral imperative to address the major issues of poverty and the burden of disease in the developing world, it's also very much in our own interests and in our interests as a community living in this one world that we all share. Now, my name, I should have said, is I, I'm Gareth Lang. I'm Professor of Experimental Physiology here, and I'm Head of the School of Biomedical Sciences. And I'm here introducing Professor Sue Welburn, who's a member of that school. Now, uh, Professor Welburn, Sue, you probably don't recognize me because I'm wearing a tie. I don't usually wear a tie. I have to say, when I came into work today, the receptionist looked at me and said, Gareth, are you practicing to be a grown-up? <laughs> uh, anyway, I think you should feel honored that I am wearing a tie tonight. Now, Sue Welburn is a professor of medical and veterinary molecular epidemiology here at the Center for Infectious Diseases. Now, some of you might still think that academics work in ivory towers and really don't get their hands dirty. Well. Uh, let me tell you a bit about Sue. Uh, Sue is not only a very active and very effective teacher to undergraduates and postgraduates. Uh, she's been prominent in postgraduate training. In fact, she's supervised more than 35 postgraduate research students through their projects. Now, her research breadth is really quite extraordinary. Uh, for the last 20 years, she's been working on human sleeping sickness and on other infectious diseases, zoonotic diseases, in humans and animals and their impact in the developing world. And her research is very much at the cutting edge of molecular uh, biology, if I could put it like that, but also applied very directly to looking at how the uh, developing understanding can be put to effective practical use in treating and dealing with this great problem of disease burden through diagnosis and treatment strategies. So she has projects presently underway in Uganda, Kenya, Nigeria, Zambia, and Tanzania. Those projects involve multinational collaborations. They're in partnership with the National Institute of Medical Research in the United States. They're partly supported here by our ministries of health and agriculture. They're supported by funding from the World Health Organization and by a range of charities, including the Wellcome Trust and the Leverhulme Trust. She is a member of the World Health Organization's expert advisory panel on drugs for neglected diseases. She's published more than 120 scientific articles in the peer-reviewed literature. She is presently coordinating three One Health programs in Africa. Stamp out sleeping sickness in Uganda, stamp out Samore in Nigeria, and a large program for control of neglected zoonoses uh, in six countries in Africa. She is also the director of our new Global Health Academy. Sue, I warmly welcome you. I invite you to give your lecture tonight. 
Thank you very much, Eric. Um, thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. And um, what I'd like to talk to you about tonight is this concept that's emerging or has been emerging for over 100 years, really, this concept of one world, one health. And I'd like us to consider whether we're really making any progress with this and what challenges we still have to, to face um, with our dream, our utopian dream. So, as you've heard from some of the lectures earlier on in this series, we're facing some really sobering global challenges. We're facing land use and climactic shifts, globalization, urbanization, our human population footprint is uh, extraordinary. We're facing fears of food and water safety, bio-event threats, threats of pollution, and emerging zoonotic disease, which is what this talk is going to focus mostly on. And I think nowhere was it more shocking the, about really our, our human footprint was when the images of Earth from space, which really were pioneering in stimulating this and fostering an environmental ethos because um, our global urban footprint became visible for the first time and we really had nowhere to hide. And uh, this is an image of Houston burning electricity like nobody's business and I would say that Houston yes we do have a problem um, with a footprint like this. With challenges we have opportunities clearly the challenges of globalization the disparities in um, health systems um, pandemic threats neglected diseases zoonotic diseases all of these are, are, are serious challenges that we we have to get to grips with and address especially in the rising um, if we want to feed the world. Um, but they come with tremendous opportunities in this, uh, in this last decade. We suddenly have political commitment. We have emerging funding models, the Global Fund and the Gates Foundation. And we have an ever-accelerating science knowledge base that we've never had before. But despite that, we have some fairly uh, awful um, legacies, especially in the developing world. Um, child mortality, 11 million preventable deaths a year. 30,000 deaths a day, leading causes, respiratory infections, diarrhea and malaria. These diseases aren't really that difficult to deal with. We've dealt with them in the developed world. Um, we could deal with them more effectively in the developing world. So global health in developing countries. This uh, lady here, this is a, a baby that was in the sleeping sickness clinic in um, mother and child in, in Uganda last time I was there. And this baby um, had cerebral malaria and it's being infused, treated. Um, prognosis for this child is very good, but this child was very fortunate that it managed to find its way to a hospital. If uh, the mother hadn't sought hospital treatment, this child wouldn't have survived. So malaria, a million deaths. Respiratory diseases, two million child deaths. Diarrheal diseases, 1.8 million child deaths. And on top of this, pure nutrition, uh, poor nutrition contributes to one in two of the deaths associated with infectious diseases in children under five years. And the UNDP announced the water and sanitation crisis and held it to be a silent emergency experienced by the poor and tolerated by those with the resources, the technology and the political power to end it. And I think this voice, this political voice that says this is actually unacceptable um, is a rising voice and one that will be heard in the next two decades. If we look at the disparities in disease burden, um, HIV AIDS kills 3 million people a year, TB 2 million a year, malaria a million a year. But what we see is that we see the poorest countries still suffering from communicable or infectious disease um, and the richest countries in the world um, having the burden of disease in their non-communicable diseases, heart disease, that type of stuff. Injuries are fairly consistent across um, the poverty um, spectrum. But if we have a look at um, global um, health, well, global health in the, in the developing world or the developing world health, we can also see that actually these non-communicable diseases are rising. And this is a function of urbanization. People are moving into the cities, they're eating different foods, and they are starting to suffer from the problems that we suffered from, or that we suffer from in the, develop, uh, the, in the developed world, heart disease and um, obesity. A billion adults overweight in the world, and ironically, 170 million, million children in poor countries are underweight, 3 million dying each year from undernutrition. 
smoking attributed deaths, 4 million estimated to rise to 10 million in 2030. And most of these smoking-related deaths are in developed or poor countries. Heart disease is on the rise. Diabetes is on the rise. HIV uh, AIDS, 42 million um, cases. But if we have a look at the diseases in red, these are the diseases that the Western world is quite frightened of. Multi-drug-resistant um, bacterial um, phenotypes, um, drug-resistant TB, H5N1. And of course, last year, we had the um, swine flu epidemic where this little piggy here was held to be responsible. But in fact, it wasn't that little piggy at all that was responsible. And it was just a, a press um, hype that, that blamed um, these pigs. Nothing to do with pigs. So out of all of this, a philosophy has been uh, emerging, or a movement has been uh, emerging, that between animal and human medicine, there is no dividing line, nor should there be. The object is different, but the experience obtained constitutes the basis of all medicine. And this is a very old um, philosophy uh, propounded by Verco in the 19th century. And today, One Health seeks to shift this paradigm from an individual or disease-centered approach to a system or community-based approach. So it's dealing with things in a holistic manner. And of course, as you've heard earlier in this series, a healthy environment is needed to require to sustain life. The health of our environment does rest with us. The condition of many of our ecosystems is changing so dramatically, altering the way that we behave and function and the way populations can survive. To address these challenges, human and animal and ecosystem health needs to be viewed as a cooperative endeavour between health practitioners, environmental scientists, in a collaborative and synergistic effort to address global challenges. And we have to accept now that we're moving from one world, one health to one medicine, which is a, a, an evolving um, an, an evolution of the one health um, uh, concept. So one world health Humans don't exist in isolation. They're part of a larger total living ecosystem. And the activities and conditions of each member do affect the others. And One Health today, in popularist terms, is often used really to describe collaboration or people working together across various disciplines in the pursuit of better health for all, human, animals, and the ecosystem in which they survive. And it's, uh, it's accepted now by medical and veterinary health providers that the impact of animal diseases and ecological change on human public health is of paramount importance. Why is it so important? Well, let's have a look. In humans, we have 1,400 uh, um, species of pathogenic organisms. 60% of these are zoonotic, and 80% of these are emerging um, species. So these are species that are taking us by surprise and, uh, and causing us difficulties. In livestock, we have 600 species of pathogens, of which 40% can infect people. Cats and dogs, we often forget about cats and dogs. There are 400 species of pathogens in cats and dogs, of which about 70% can infect humans. So the animals that we live with and the manner in which we live and interact with animals can have a serious impact on our, our health. And the role of these pathogens in causing human disease can be particularly important because many of these diseases are very are highly lethal. So the 1,415 known human pathogens, 62% have come from animals. Some need infected animals or animal products to be transmitted to humans. Others are emerging pathogens. These are pathogens that cross the species barrier and adapt to a new human post. So this would be HIV AIDS, SARS. Once they've established, they circulate within the population. Zooanthropinotic diseases pass from animals to humans. Zoonoses are infections that are shared by humans and animals. These can be epidemic, for example, rabies or Rift Valley fever, or they can be endemic, brucellosis, echinococcosis. And we'll come back to some of these diseases. And there are five recognized stages of infection or, or um, evolution of infectious disease. The first stage is that the pathogen only exists in animals and can't transmit to humans. Unfortunately, most um, most of the time, this is the state that we're in between one and two, where the animal pathogen may be transmitted to humans but doesn't transmit between humans. So an example of this would be rabies. Then we get into more serious territory. The animal pathogens transmitted between humans for a few cycles, causing occasional outbreaks that die out quickly. And some of our most violent hemorrhagic fevers, like Ebola, are examples of this type of disease. 
The animal pathogens can then undergo more extended transmission between humans. This is yellow fever, dengue, and cholera. I mean, dengue is a, is a major, major problem now, and cholera, of course, we have a cholera outbreak um, now in uh, Haiti. Pathogens then can become exclusive to humans, and these ones are, uh, have either co-evolved with us or made the animal to, species, uh, to human jump um, a while ago for measles, mumps, rubella, smallpox, syphilis, and again, some forms of HIV. So what are the drivers of this pathogen emergence that, that we're seeing? Well, clearly society and demography, um, HIV and disease, um, hospitals, non-chosomal infections. Nobody, uh, every, people are very worried about going into hospital because they might pick up something that they weren't uh, bargaining for when they went through the hospital doors. International travel. Um, and of course, we saw the impacts of international, um, on interna or the amount of international travel that's going on and the disruption this will cause for this uh, volcanic eruption earlier um, in the last year. Land use and agriculture, climate change, food and water, international trade, and the failure of any form of control of disease. And then we have pathogen evolution, um, resistance, new strains arising from, from resistance like you have with malaria. But what we're really frightened of and what governments are frightened of are these pandemics. Um, and this documents the spread of um, H5N1. This is um, a chicken vendor in Uganda um, flogging chickens, triple-decker chicken um, sales. Um, and of course, this disease emerged in 1997 in Hong Kong and um, spread very rapidly through China, Vietnam and Thailand, Cambodia, Indonesia, up through Turkey, Azerbaijan, Egypt, Djibouti, across to Nigeria, Laos, Myanmar, and Pakistan, on to Bangladesh, and 2009, just about everywhere. So, I mean, it's very, very rapid. We can have very, very rapid spread of disease. And of course, this um, H5N1, uh, Mamuna Chowdhury in the uh, audience here is a PhD student working on um, uh, bird flu and uh, it's a, it's a very frightening disease, and it, and it is important that, that, people, that people fear this. But it's the risk to um, the developed world is, is, is really far less than, um, than we would expect um, in these terms, and we're always frightened of these pandemics because of the impacts. Marburg virus. In Uganda, 2008, um, there was a case of hemorrhagic fever in a US traveler who returned from Uganda. And I uh, don't know if you can see the offerings on this um, advert at this uh, Chicana Savari Lodge. One of them is, um, this is all fair enough, forest walks, crater walks, lake canoes, game drives, sundown cruises, bird walks, gorge trek. And then there's something called bat caves. Now, if you're offered a trip to a bat cave, probably best to avoid it in Uganda. Um, because before you know it, Bats are being dissected and people are um, bleeding from various orifices. And um, oh, this is another one on the, uh, the, the tourist trail. This is actually called a viper, this is viper cave. So if you, uh, I'd give that a miss as well, but for, for different reasons. But bat caves, viper caves. Some people like these things, but I would tend to give them a bit of a miss. So what are our zoonotic challenges? Well, our zoonotic challenge is to prevent disease events rather than react to them. And this really does depend on a one health principle, coordination of wildlife, environment, human and animal health sectors. Prevention is always cheaper and preferable to control. It avoids disease impacts, but it's, it's still expensive, but nothing like as expensive as, um, as a pandemic situation to deal with. But it's difficult to get long-term donor commitment out with an emergency. I think we've all seen that with uh, Band-Aid and uh, various drives for fundraising. You need an emergency to get um, public opinion, you need public opinion to get political opinion, and uh, the whole thing, um, uh, they fuel each other. Um, a very good example of this is the amount of um, drug across the world available now to treat so-called swine flu. Uh, most of those drugs were short-lived and most of them are having to be destroyed now, but most of the governments in Europe and in fact globally spent an enormous amount of money, um, quite rightly, on attempting to, va to, um, to treat if there was an outbreak of, um, or if, if, if that um, went pandemic. Of course it didn't and we're left with drugs that can be, cannot be used, but it would have been cheaper not to have had a, an outbreak in the first place. 
not all control measures um, or methods can have positive outcomes. Some may present a negative social and environmental results. Um, for control of rabies in China, slaughter of dogs many people find unpalatable, or extermination of migratory waterfowl in order to control avian influenza in Thailand. And not all of the, you know, it's a very delicate balance between control methods and, um, and, uh, and results. And the recent negative impact, of course, on the pig industry, industry from the so, from so-called swine flu, when, as, as we've heard, Mr. Piggy wasn't really responsible for this. But despite our best intentions, it's not always very straightforward to achieve intersectoral collaboration. Uh, we do have some successful One Health examples, including Predict and Ahead, um, which we'll come to later. And uh, this concept of, of vets and medics working together for public health, of global public health, um, in 2005, um, the veterinary record and the British Medical Journal got together and said they were going to have a joint publication issue because they recognised that actually this One Health concept was so important to them. But sadly, we don't have another issue in 2010. So, you know, this was a, a very nice response from both of these illustrious journals, but it would be nice to have one every year, um, an edition on One Health, because if we deem it to be that important. So emerging infectious diseases, well, we can have wildlife emerging infectious diseases, domestic animal infectious diseases, and human emerging diseases. And like we've looked at, some of these are human encroachment into habitats, some are response, uh, as a response from ecological manipulation, encroachment, spillover and back, intensification of agriculture, technology and industry, um, and travel. So what are our trends in global health? Well, the trends now are to work collaboratively with key partners to explore the pathways to translate the scientific advances that we're developing at such a tremendous pace into policy and practice and to enable effective intervention because there's not really very much point investing huge amounts of money in research in the developed and the developing world to solve problems if these problems aren't going to be solved by what you develop. So there's a big gap between what's being developed in the West predominantly in terms of science and technology. I mean, we're sequencing genomes every night now, or probably more than one genome a night, and yet where is this ending up? Why are we still having all of this mortality and death and disease in the developing world? It, you know, it's, it's quite inequitable. So there is a rise in the emergence of new fields, and donors are recognising this, that have to link human, animal and ecological health um, and un in attempts to understand these complex interactions. And social sciences, of course. But programs, um, they may be called conservation medicine, global geology, ecological geography, or ecosystem health, but all of their principles are a One Health principle. They're just called different things depending on which decade uh, we're in. And if you stay doing science for long enough, you see them coming around again, uh, which is good, really. But our goal is towards evidence, uh, research and evidence-based interventions against these major health problems in societies affecting societies across the globe. But this One Health agenda is dominated by the sphere of pathogen emergence. And you can see why. If we have a look at the global trends in emerging infectious disease, most of the new infections, if we're looking at emerging infections, have come through from wildlife. Most of them are in um, the developing world. Um, there are a few non-wildlife-based infections um, in areas where population pressure is very high. Uh, we have drug resistance appearing again. Um, this is to do with hospital infections and uh, misuse of antibiotics. Again, this is um, across the developed uh, world and the part of the developing world. And then we have vector-borne disease. And of course, vector-borne disease is intrinsically linked to climate change. Uh, vectors are absolutely um, linked to climate. But we also have some very nice um, tools now. This is global rainfall from September. Um, and uh, if we have a look at rainfall accumulation, of course, we can actually use these um, geosensing tools to predict what's happening in the world in terms of um, problems with vector-borne disease. Tsetse flies, for example, like specific environmental conditions. So you can have a look at rainfall and rainfall maps and data like this to predict what might happen. So we do have some tools to fight uh, and model simulations. But we've also got a very hungry world. And this is another problem for us in terms of zoonotic disease and One Health, because we have to feed people. We have to feed everybody. We can't feed everybody on grain. We need to have animal protein. So we, the, our contact with animals is going to increase. 
there's a slum in Nairobi where just about everything um, on the planet is living in close proximity with people. I mean, they did a survey of animals in there. All sorts of stuff was, was being housed and kept in, in, this, uh, in this very densely human populated area. Then the government of Nairobi said, well, we're going to take all of the animals out of the slum. And of course, they're all back again. But you know, it's, it's a very difficult thing to separate people from, from animals. In 1798, Thomas Malthus, in his essay on Principle of Population, he predicted that the world population would increase to the limit of the productivity of the land. And many people are concerned that we've now reached that limit and that agriculture is in imminent danger of failing to feed the world's population. And we will turn to animal protein in this um, scenario. And you can see here, this is a map of world hunger. And of course, Africa, as usual, doesn't fare too well in any of these um, scenarios. But you could overlay um, this, um, this map with a, with a number of other parameters. Developing regions make up an increasing share of the world population. And this is just an example of, of Uganda again. This is population growth around um, Lake Victoria. And you can see that it, it's ex this area has exhibited extraordinary population growth. And most of these um, people are young people um, with um, one or, or no parents, um, orphans and all 70% uh, of them are, are under 16. And if we have a look at uh, the situation in Uganda, this is an accumulative map of rainfall in Africa. And I mean, Uganda does, it fares quite well. So I mean, it has a good agricultural system, but that good agricultural system cannot continue to feed um, all of these, uh, this population without animals coming into the um, food chain. This is just as an aside because cholera has been in the news this week. This is how we can use sea surface temperatures to predict cholera um, outbreaks. And this is what we're looking at with the zoonotic diseases. Now, how do you use all of this remote sensing data that's been accumulated over years? We have 20, 30 years of sea surface temperature data, and you can predict um, cholera outbreaks um, and other infectious diseases outbreaks by looking simply at the, the sea surface temperature. So these are quite useful tools, and these are things that we couldn't do before. So our emerging epidemic zoonoses attract much One Health interest. Endemic zoonotic diseases rarely give rise to collaboration between the medical and veterinary professions, and especially in developing countries, and yet these are the diseases that they're having to deal with. And you can see why, really. Um, this is how much uh, the economic impact of, of some of the, the zoonotic diseases, foot and mouth, 25 to 30 billion, SARS, BSE, um, avian flu, you know, the big, big impacts. But actually, we have a look on the left, um, on the bars to the left. You can see that rabies, leishmaniasis, human African trypanosomiasis, Chagas disease, equine, uh, a Japanese encephalitis, these actually um, cause more human deaths a year, far more than Nipah or H5N1 or SARS. But the, the impact on, um, on policy is driven by the big circles on the right, because these are the economic drivers that, uh, I mean, this is what drives the world. It's a business world. And this is an adaptation from David Molyneux's slide from the University of Liverpool. And uh, he often says with the neglected tropical diseases, if aliens were going to land on the planet, you know, they'd think that there was only AIDS, TB, and malaria. There weren't any other diseases. And similarly for the neglected zoonoses, they say, oh, well, they've only got emerging zoonotic diseases on that planet. There are no endemic disease. Everything else, it's just all new diseases that are emerging out of nowhere. And this One Health agenda, or the political agenda of One Health, is, is really dominated by who pays. And this is based on donor prioritization. Provider interests, when a disease is perceived to be a threat to the wealthier nations, or when farmers see the disease as a source of potential sales, donors and investors are far more likely to pay up and pay attention. SARS, Nipah, H5N1, and swine flu, and swine flu like I said earlier. You know, virtually every country bought in stockpiles of antiretrovirals to prevent a, fly, a swine flu pandemic. It didn't happen. The drugs that were actually released onto the market were actually quite short-lived, and most of them are expiring next year. So all of that investment is wasted because the drugs can't be used for anything else. Um, trade and industrial interests, they can't even be given away because the, the expiry date's um, so low. So trade and industrial interests, uh, the neglected tropical diseases within which neglected zoonoses sit are low priority just because there's, there's just negligible, marketable opportunities. 
So these neglected zoonoses, they're no major threat to wealthier countries. But is that true? I mean, we should be worrying about leishmaniasis. It's coming up with global warming. Leishmaniasis is coming up through, um, through the Middle East. Um, it's a terribly disfiguring disease. Um, for Nobody wants that disease. Um, no young girls want holes in their face. Um, no powerful interest groups have mobilized around these diseases until now. So what are these diseases? Well, there's rabies, hydatid, echinococcosis. Um, these are all circulating between dogs and people, wild dogs and domestic dogs. We've got our vector-borne neglected zoonoses, leishmaniasis and trypanosomiasis. Um, leishmaniasis, hideously disfiguring, trypanosomiasis or sleeping sickness, absolutely fatal if it's not treated. Um, from cows and wildlife, brucellosis, bovine TB. And from pigs, cystosicosis, and again, sleeping sickness. And we have a, a more of a worry, really, in terms of global, <laughs> globalisation and feeding um, the population, because the likelihood that animal diseases will cross the species barrier, beginning to affect humans, is faster than it's ever been before in uh, history. Climate change is affecting biodiversity, urbanisation, deforestation and habitat change, brought about by us and from global warming, contributing to the decline of many species. It's hard to predict which diseases might make this leap, and it's complicated by the fact that we don't really know, very, we don't really know what's coming and, and when it's going to hit us. And it's a bit of a nightmare, a nightmare really, Darwin's nightmare. Um, in 2006, in, the, uh, in conservation biology, um, it was reported that nearly a quarter of the world's planet, plant and vertebrate animal species could be extinct by 2050. And current extinction rates are at least 100 to 1,000 times higher than the background or natural rates. And the problem for us with, um, with this and infectious disease is the fear that as species disappear, human diseases will spike. Because we know that a healthy environment is required to sustain life, and the health of our environment rests with us. And one factor that can affect emergence of zoonosis is biodiversity, because this is a measure of ecosystem health. So as we lose species diversity, many people think that we're going to see a rise in the transmission of zoonotic disease. Um, and then, in fact, biodiversity or a healthy biodiversity can reduce pathogen transmission among hosts and protect health. So the more variety of living things out there that there are, the healthier the system is. And when you end up with a reservoir species, and that's all that's left in an ecosystem, humans are far more likely to come into contact with that infected animal increasing the chances that the agent could jump species. And this is especially true for uh, rabies, cystosicosis, and these neglected zoonoses. And um, the disease um, that I work on, human sleeping sickness, the one I've worked on most in my life, uh, there are some areas where we don't have any wildlife anymore, and we have almost entire um, disease pooling between humans and cattle, and we'll come back to that. Ecological disruption, of course, um, Huge amounts of bushmeat are harvested every year, exposing people to, um, to all sorts of horrid um, diseases. But we do have some One Health success stories. Clearly, global eradication of smallpox in 1980 was a tremendous success. And this was um, followed by um, the sister disease in the animal world, rinderpest, um, the rinderpest eradication program. And just this year, They've actually um, declared, I think last month, that um, rinderpest has now been eradicated globally. And so this is cattle plague as opposed to, to smallpox. And this is a tremendous success and a major achievement. And uh, FAO and all of these donors club together to do this. And this is it's partly because this is an economic um, problem, but it was deemed so important that, that people should get together and do it. So you can do it. So these big... Um, animal and human killers can be um, eliminated. The eradication of smallpox and rinderpest were possible because it was able, we were able to clearly identify the importance of the threat and communicate that importance and mobilise and identify the resources. And as um, Peter Walker here, Professor of Nutrition and Human Security at Friedman School um, at Tuff says, eradication of rinderpest is an incredible turning point for East Africa. It alleviates food insecurity and strengthens the economy. But the eradication of rinderpest will lead to a pooling or an increase in cattle density in these areas and possibly um, an increase in other diseases. So although we've done one, 
perhaps we need to do more. Predict is a, a very interesting One Health um, emerging landscape. Um, this is a, a concept which has mobilized $75 million um, to build a global early warning system for emerging diseases that can move between wildlife and people. And uh, what this project is doing is identifying at high-risk areas in the world where surveillance for animal diseases um, should be increased. And it focuses on viruses, of, but it, it does focus on pandemic virus potential, um, potential killers, influenza, SARS, Ebola, HIV. And it's building capacity in these hotspots. And these are the countries where they're worried about um, these emerging infectious diseases. Um, and it, it is from wildlife and people, so it's, it's responding to that. But that's a lot of money to mobilise to, to, to do that in the country. But we also are present, we have unusual threats. It's not all about um, people um, in terms of One Health. This is um, moving of um, toxoplasmosis from cats to sea otters. And in California from 1998, started to see an enormous die-off of sea otters. 17% um, of the dead otters were found to have died from a brain disease caused by Toxoplasma gondii. Uh, many were infected, um, they were weakened, and then the others were snacked on by sharks um, because they obviously were um, feeling a little bit sick. The, um, this toxoplasmosis um, can be transmitted to mammals through ingestion of parasites by uh, faecal contamination. And this is from domestic cats. And what they found uh, when they investigated this is that cats, including bobcats and mountain lions, were shedding oocysts into the soil. These were washing into the bay. The otters um, living near the streams and rivers were three times more likely to be infected. And the mussels were, that the otters were feeding on were believed to concentrate these parasites. And, and these poor otters had no immunity to toxoplasma. And this is a couple of little otters. They, they evidently hold hands when they're sleeping so they don't get lost, which I think is quite sweet. But anyway, these poor little otters um, had a really bad time with uh, toxoplasmosis. And you can see here that... Um, Cat feces was shedding into the bay, being taken up by otters, and then these otters were, were being, um, were being uh, infected. And this is work by um, UC Davis in the States. Oh, gone the wrong way. Perhaps one of the, the ways that our one, uh, one very, very good example really of One Health program working the other way or working both ways is this Mountain Gorilla One Health program. Because, you know, of course, everybody wants to go and see Mountain Gorillas. They're an absolutely marvelous um, experience. Um, but they get our diseases. So, you know, we don't really want to go and have ecotourism or um, go into their area and, and prevent um, and give them diseases. So we have to think about preventive healthcare measures that can be provided to part workers and their families to reduce the impact of our diseases being transmitted to this uh, endangered species. And how the health of human and human well-being of human communities surrounding the parts can be elevated. Uh, if you don't have healthy people um, and good economies around the parks, then people will not value the wildlife in the parks. And it's, it's all a very delicate balance between health and well-being in these communities. A very no another very good example of One Health is, is this AHEAD program, Animal Health for Environment and Development. Again, it's from wildlife, and this is a series of case studies in Africa looking at the value of One Health as an entry point, but mostly, again, from conservation and development. And they have, they have um, working groups from the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Park, um, Kavango and Zambezi, Great Apes Project, uh, and projects in Zambia and Namibia. And it's all helping people to understand disease and how disease trans is transmitted between um, animals, wildlife, um, domestic animals, and um, people in the communities. So as I said earlier, do we have a sick future? A species disappear, and they are going to disappear. Um, human diseases may spike. And sleeping sickness uh, is a good example of this. Now, sleeping sickness in the past was classically believed to be associated with living in close proximity to game parks because early on, um, at the turn of the last century, um, people were identifying parasites in animals, in wild animals, um, before large-scale domestication of, um, of cattle in these parts. And so the disease was associated with tsetse flies transmitting the disease and... Um, wildlife. But because of the political history in Uganda 
um, of uh, checkered political history. A lot of um, hunting and um, diversity of species was eliminated due to um, various civil um, insurrections. And what we're left with in Uganda is transmission of these parasites really between domestic livestock and man. And we'll just have a quick look at this paradox, really. These um, are the major neglected zoonotic diseases, um, these hot spots in, um, globally. The main features of neglected zoonoses are poor populations in remote areas or slums with no political voice. They're linked to poverty, unsafe water, unsafe food. All of them, low-income countries, are affected similarly by multiple diseases, and that's a big problem for control because communities aren't just facing one disease, they're facing multiple, multiple diseases. Um, they're communicable, but they don't travel far, so they're not perceived to be a threat to other countries, mostly disabling and disfiguring lifelong disabilities. Some of them don't kill you, they, um, they just impair your growth and development. And there's low priority because there's a lack of evidence and um, data and statistics. A lot of them are stigmatising and discriminatory. They promote poverty, impair education and economic development. And the bottom billion are at most risk of, of actually acquiring these diseases. And a disproportionate burden is borne by poor people. Um, they're more likely to acquire a zoonotic disease. They bear a greater burden. They're more vulnerable to illness. And they have a poorer prognosis once they're infected. They can't get diagnostic um, care. Treatment's expensive. Cost of health care seeking is expensive. There are parallel difficulties in getting animals treated. People are living in isolated areas or urban slums. They're in very close proximity with animals and there's no service provision. And there's a, diamond, a reliance on family members um, to look after um, the farm and to feed the family. And livestock income is a critical part of a coping strategy. And sleeping sickness is, is one of the examples of, of one of these diseases. Sleeping sickness was known as the colonial disease um, because when we were colonizing Africa, there was a huge devastating epidemic of sleeping sickness in Uganda that killed about 300,000 people. And this was basically all of the population of the lake shore of Lake Victoria. The maps I showed earlier of the population, this was the, the area where we had this disease. And of course, the colonial services were very worried because the workforce was, being, um, was dying and um, it wasn't a good thing. So uh, it was so noteworthy that um, this was a postcard um, it was burial of a sleeping sickness victim. Um, so it was such a noteworthy disease that people were sending postcards about, about this uh, illness. And by 1908, a third of the population of Bisoga were dead. And in 1909, Governor Bell had, to, had no choice but to order evacuation from the lake shore, and uh, everybody left. So they removed people from the disease. And at that time, they didn't really know what was causing the disease. Um, they knew it was transmitted by tsetse flies, they thought it was coming from wildlife, they didn't know if it was being transmitted from people, but they knew that taking people away from the flies and from the lake would be a good thing, so that's how they dealt with that. But in 1999, we started having a, a dreadful public health crisis in Uganda because the disease started to come back, and this red stain here of the disease um, started to move, and it started to infect numerous districts. And this is just a very good example of the impact of a zoonotic disease, one disease on these communities. Uh, there is no healthcare facilities here that can deal with sleeping sickness. There's no diagnostic facilities. So once the disease starts to move, it moves very rapidly and, uh, and infects many, many people. And they were frightened, of course, of a, a very large epidemic. And basically, the disease is moving around these swamps. These swamps are a nightmare because you can't get into them within two minutes of, uh, of leaving the, uh, your vehicle. Um, you're up to your thighs in mud, so you can't actually penetrate these swamps to put any traps down or to do any control. So you really have to do something a little bit more strategic and sensible. And in 2000, we, we noticed that uh, a new, this is when an introduction was moved to a new district. We knew when patient zero or the first case was reported. And the first case was reported in this new district in 1998. And then they had 70 cases in 18 months. Now, it doesn't sound very many, 70 cases, but this is a quite, a, quite a small district. And for every case that does report to a clinic for treatment, at least 13 people have died. So it's, uh, it's a grossly underreported um, figure. This area had never had any 
um, human African trypanosomiasis or sleeping sickness before, but we did notice that the cases were all near this cattle market. And what had happened was cattle were being brought in because this was an area that had been subject to intensive cattle raiding. So people had all their cows stolen and then the government of Uganda th and donors thought they were doing the right thing by giving people cows again. So there was a huge trade in cows um, and these cattle markets were traded. So we did a very nice case control study where we just went into the hospital and matched cases for age and sex and admission month and then we calculated the distance to the market. And what we found was that early on, all of the cases were coming within very close proximity from the cattle market, suggesting that the cows were bringing the disease into these new communities. And this is a territorial disease. This is, um, if you do have sleeping sickness, you have to be treated with arsenic-based drugs. So it's a kill or cure principle with sleeping sickness. The drugs, we've had no new drugs for a very long time. Uh, this malazoprol is, is a drug which has problems of compliance and this was um, a very nice man, um, well he wasn't a very nice man, he was a, a dreadful man um, because I was working all hours dissecting tsetse flies in a laboratory just next to where he was being treated at the hospital and he was chained to a log and was screaming and ranting and raving um, all night and all day um, because his sleep-wake cycles had been disrupted and um, he was very sick but very loud and um, he was, the treatment is so horrible that he was chained to this log. This was in um, Cote d'Ivoire. This is um, treatment. Uh, the treatment's so awful people want to run away. So he was chained to this piece of wood. Um, but it turned out actually that after the treatment took effect that uh, this is the same man, that actually this man had um, a master's degree from Liverpool. He was a teacher. He uh, spoke perfect English, German and of course French and was an absolute charmer. So, you know, th this disease can have dramatic impacts on people. And of course, there's the belief in the community that somebody's been bewitched because these um, changes in your physiology are so extreme that, uh, that you have to be cursed or bewitched in order to be behaving like that. But um, after a while, he was as right as rain. But the, uh, they still wouldn't untie him from his log until the treatment had been finished. And then it was quite good because he would be dragging the log backwards and forwards and begging to be unchained from the log. But they weren't having any of it, the medical profession. So what we did, because we have some science now um, and we have a very nice marker to determine if the human parasite is in these uh, cattle, um, we went in and screened these animals and we found about 42% of the animals in these areas were carrying human infective trypanosomes. Now, given all the fuss that we had over um, foot and mouth disease in this country, I think we would know if what would happen here if communities were being exposed at this rate to something that if a tsetse fly bites one of these animals um, and then bites you, you'll get a disease that will actually kill you if you don't get treatment. I think, you know, we would be doing something about it, but of course, um, life's not that simple. But we are doing something about it. And what we've been doing over the last uh, five years is setting up our own One Health partnership, which is this Stump Out Sleeping Sickness partnership, which is a public-private partnership for control of this disease in Uganda. It's funded by venture capitalists. It's supported by a drug company, French drug company, Seva Santé Animal. It involves the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Animal Industries, University of America, um, McCary and, um, and Edinburgh. And what we do is when the disease moves into a new area in Uganda, we go in and we treat all of the animals with a trypanoside because while the drug is really toxic for people, it's very simple and straightforward and cheap to treat animals with this disease. So we go in and treat all of the animals and then we prevent market introductions, reinforce government policy, and then we follow on by preventing animals from getting infected by giving these animals a spray um, onto their belly and legs. And it's not really very revolutionary. It's really quite straightforward and quite simple. But it's a new approach to dealing with this disease because the old approach was the colonial approach, which was to go in and screen people. Now, we've got 42% of the animals infected, and yet we're going to use all of our resources to go and try and find one in 1,000 or one in, one in 10,000 people infected and treat those. So it doesn't really make very much sense to go in and screen people when you can actually just go in and treat animals to eliminate infection. 
So it's just a different One Health approach. Um, and this is proving to be very effective, and we have actually stopped spread of disease in Uganda like this. One Health could be very effective. What we need to think of now, or the buzzword of today, is ecosystem services, human health and well-being. So this is an extension of the One Health principle. And public health now is moving towards global sy systemic and ecologically sound approaches to resource management. We need to recognise that ecosystems are a valuable service. Um, we need to have a shift to healthy ecosystems, framing human health and well-being in the context of an ecosystem's approach, where healthy people and environments are inextricably linked. And I think you can see that, because we need to know that we have biodiversity, healthy people, healthy systems. But 60% of our global vital ecosystem services are now degraded or under pressure. And these health impacts on poor and vulnerable populations do act as a barrier to us achieving our MDGs and, and any goal for elimination of, uh, of infectious disease. And across most of Africa in particular, there's, an ind there's a complete lack of assessment and monitoring of the evaluation and dynamics of human activities and their impact on local systems. So we need integrated policies that can be promoted that value these ecosystem services. There are a lot of unknown knowns. We don't know how human impact on ecosystems can be distinguished from natural perturbations. This is obvious from climate change debates. Um, we don't know how ecosystem services are maintained despite altered ecological communities. Um, we don't know what landscape and human settlement patterns mitigate disease spread. We don't know what strategies can keep systems from becoming pathological. And we don't know what the role of adaptation is within role of uh, these altered ecosystems. So that we have a huge number of unknown knowns. So these, these are probably our, our biggest challenges in the next decade. And unfortunately, donors and, and governments are now appreciating that we have to have a more holistic approach to, to human health, that we can't just solve it with an injection or a tablet. And this is quite a nice example here of um, uh, ecological uh, mess, really. This is crocodiles dying in the Kruger National Park. Uh, hundreds of crocodiles began dying in the Elephant's Gorge. And this was really just um, pollution. Post-mortem showed that the crocodiles died of pancreatitis, a disease that results in hardening of the body fat as a result of ina and inadequate antioxidant levels. And these crocodiles lose their mobility and starve. And of course, this is on the crocodiles, you know, in this community, people are, are living off the water here as well. So, I mean, it's, it's not a, a good um, prognosis. And this is um, recycling at the Stung Machini dump in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, where families scavenge through 100 acre tip collecting rubbish to contribute to the family income. Materials are sold onto the recycling business, generating about a dollar a day for these family incomes. And David Pred, the aid worker here that is credited with this photograph, you know, I think he's quite right, says this is the closest thing to hell on earth that I've ever seen. And this is a function of people moving into the cities of, uh, of globalization. So One Health is here to stay. Between animal and human medicine, there is no dividing line. I think we've seen that, nor should there be. Um, we need a healthy environment. Um, and we need to address these challenges in a comprehensive and collaborative manner. Fortunately, we have the Manhattan Principles, where health experts um, are driving um, these agendas. A lot of it's coming from the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, and we now have the United Nations wanting us to value ecosystem services um, and making statements about that, which I think will probably result in, in much more investment at, uh, at a country and a global scale. As they say, countries should mitigate the underlying causes of ecosystem damage, simultaneously improving human health. Solutions require political commitment, concerted action and shared responsibility between different governmental section, sectors and civil society, capacity building, dissemination of knowledge and, all, and good practices and integrated action for health and the environment are all <coughs> critical. Fortunately, we do have some significant donors, Bill and Melinda Gates, the Wellcome Trust, Google Foundation, and uh, you know, we're even getting your one here on the front of Time magazine. So I think these commitments are all good, and, uh, and these investments will be worthwhile in the long run. And I think we can learn a lot as well from the neglected tropical disease 
lobby group who were um, making huge inroads into eliminating some of the neglected tropical diseases. And what they've done is they've got very firmly um, in bed with pharma to support these, uh, these developments. And I think the private sector has a tremendous role to play um, for helping control these diseases. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. You've, you've given us some really great examples to, to think about. Um, if I can kind of ref begin by reflecting on it. Uh, it's, you might often think that when you've got a disease, when you've got a disease person, then you know, as academics, as medical scientists, we should kind of tackle that person and tackle that disease, and that should be the focus of what we spend our money on. That's really not how academia works. Uh, we actually step back and say, well, that you begin with an understanding, and the understanding might lead you to a quite different answer. And, so that, and in this case, you've given this fantastic example, really, of basically understanding how the disease process works leads you not to treat the people, but to treat the animals. And often when you have got that understanding and found that route, those treatments are sometimes really quite cheap and quite simple. In fact, many of the drugs for some of the, that uh, offer the cure for these diseases, we already have, and we already know about them, it's often a matter of actually getting them to the right place at the right time with the understanding of when diseases are likely to occur and a real understanding of what their causes are in particular areas. So and wha basically what I'm saying is that tackling these major problems is sometimes a matter of building up this understanding, this basic understanding of the biology of what's going on. Anyway, uh, th thanks for that lecture. Now it's open to the floor and Sue is willing to kind of respond to any questions that you have. I think there are a couple of microphones floating around. So if you've got a question for Sue, please wait for it. Put your hand up and wait for a microphone to get to you. Thank you, Alan. I think that um, it's a tricky one. Yeah. It's a very tricky one. I think that some communities can probably do quite well without any animal protein, but when you have the levels of starvation and hunger in um, certain communities, especially in children, then I think you have to give animal protein. We don't have enough cereal to, um, to feed the world. Anyone that says that we do, I'm not convinced that they've done their sums correctly. The biggest impact on poverty in a community is to give people chickens. But then we run risks with that. And pigs, of course, are a very popular way of um, generating protein fast and, uh, and feeding communities. The problem, of course, with keeping pigs is that if there are no veterinary services or no services in these communities because of privatisation, then there's no veterinary care and then these diseases and husbandry of these animals is, is a worry. Um, thank you. Um, I was wondering why the approach seems to be eradication in terms of trying to solve the problems. You mentioned that there were just over 1,400 pathogens in humans, and yet, as a global society, a global health effort, we've managed to eradicate one in the last 30 years. Some others we have the ability, but clearly don't have the determination, be it polio or something else, that we were apparently going to eradicate by 2000. 
surely it would be more sensible to go back to a principle put forward in the first lecture about population. If the people weren't there, the cows wouldn't be there, the pooling wouldn't be there, there wouldn't be the impact, the bush meat wouldn't be being harvested, all the other things that you're exemplifying as to why they cause the problems. Would it not be a more productive approach to look at that rather than what seems to be a tiny drop in the ocean of attempting to mitigate such a massive problem being caused by other things? I think that's a very good uh, question. And in fact, last week I was at, um, in Nairobi at a, a meeting with a whole load of wildlife and um, sociologists who were raising exactly the same um, issues. I think it's very easy for us to say all of our problems could be alleviated by controlling populations. Um, a lot of people thought that the AIDS pandemic would do a fairly effective job at controlling populations in Africa. Uh, it's proved not to be the case. Um, we can't ignore the elephant in the room that is China in terms of population. Um, eradication, yeah, I'm with you on that. Um, a lot of people would like to eradicate tsetse flies. I wouldn't like to do that. I think they're beautiful insects with their own uh, merit and uh, a beautiful example of biodiversity in that species. Um, I think eliminating any species or organism is um, probably comes at considerable cost and risk. For smallpox and rinderpest, I think they're the only two that uh, there was probably a justification for going for elimination. I think when you try and extend the principles of those without the political will and the buy-in to do that, everything becomes impossible. So we are just dealing with control. And of course, if p the biggest driver or the biggest factor in controlling population growth is education of women and money. The more money a community has and the more money a community can make, the more educated the women are in that community and the more informed choice the women have in terms of controlling their fertility. So there you have it. I don't want 10 children. I don't need 10 children. Um, I, I wouldn't mind though. <laughs> Uh, I was just um, going to ask a question about um, the impact of the uh, current um, EU bilateral uh, trade agreements with India um, that are currently being discussed at the moment and if they go through um, what kind of effect um, the production of generic medicines being stopped will have on neglected trop trop tropical disease? Well you probably know the answer to that. <laughs> um, Pharma have a huge role to play in the control of infectious disease. For most of these diseases, um, we have some element of um, therapy or prevention. The issue is getting it there. Um, bed nets, for example, impregnated bed nets. You know, everyone thought that was going to be quite easy to get enough bed nets across Africa. Um, you know, it turns out that we've made a drop in the ocean against um, malaria. And in fact, last week there was a program on the TV um, putting uh, one of the places that I work at in Uganda as the malaria, malaria, you know, the top malaria place in the world, which is, of course, I'm sure very pleasing for those communities. Um, you know, and that's not that impenetrable. So it's about distribution, quality drugs, quality production. We don't want too many hooky drugs on the market. Um, but then again, drugs have to be provided and someone's got to provide them at a cost that communities can afford. But then at the same, by the same token, um, African governments and uh, developing world governments do have budgets and they do have money. They also have to make choices and decisions about how that money's spent. And um, until people have a political voice in the rural communities to demand an adequate standard of care, um, these problems are always going to go round and round. It's not easy. 
I think, uh, again, I, mean, I think the problem with the bed nets uh, for, the, for students here may, may not have kind of picked up on that. I mean, bed nets were actually a very simple uh, control system for malaria. You know, the, the idea is very simple, that you, that you simply sleep under a net that's impregnated uh, with something that will kill off the mosquitoes. Very simple, low-tech solution, you're safe. And, uh, the, and it can be distributed and used every, everywhere. And the real problem is that, although it's a low-tech solution, these bed, bed nets weigh a couple of kilograms. Well, that's not so bad. But when you've got to distribute them in a country that's got no roads, and you've got to kind of walk with them uh, everywhere, then actually getting them out to the people is a real problem. So, you know, the, these, the problems of poverty and lack of infrastructure tie into these problems of disease, don't they? Indeed, and, and the social problems, of course, you know, bed nets um, are really, really hot. <laughs> it's really, really hot in a lot of places to sleep under a net. Um, it's okay if you're in a nice air-conditioned room or you're on the beach and there's a breeze blowing through, but if you're in the uh, jungle, essentially, and it's very hot anyway, trying to persuade children to actually remain under a net uh, through the night uh, is almost impossible. Okay, well, th well, thank you very much, Sue, for, for a very thought-provoking lecture. Thank you all thank for you. coming. And <laughs> and I hope I'll see most of you again next week when Dorothy Crawford is talking about infectious diseases. This production is Copyright, the University of Edinburgh.